and that is uh, the fact that we're now connecting uh, a lot of devices around the world. The thing that we call Internet of Things. Uh, and more precisely, we're going to talk about the uh, security implications of that. Uh, it's estimated that somewhere around 6.4 billion devices will be connected by the end of this year. And that's 30% more than last year. So it's quite a rapid growth. And depending on who you trust, by the year 2020, we'll have 20 to 50 billion devices connected. And that's quite many of them, and that's only four years away. Uh, so it's going to happen a lot within this field, and we're going to see a lot of security problems with that. Um, I am going to mention that Sigma do have its own IoT platform. Uh, it's called Sensation, or if it's in collaboration with Ericsson, it's called Appiot. Uh, so that depends on who you talk to. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. But if you have questions, we can do, do that afterwards. So let's start uh, with trying to define what security is a little bit. Um, security is, is quite many things, and, and, but we're going to talk about what is commonly known as cybersecurity uh, or IT security. Uh, it, it consists of software and hardware uh, security measures. And there's a lot of different aspects to it, and I've listed quite many here, the, the main ones. And I'm not going to go through them, and I'm sure that you actually recognize some of them. Uh, the one that might not be that familiar is the last one, the non-repudiation. Uh, and non-repudiation is basically the opposite of anonymity. Uh, it's, it's when you log into a system and access a file, uh, non-repudiation means that you cannot deny that later on. It's going to be enough evidence to prove that you have done that. Um, so, in a sense, it's opposite of anonymity. If anonymity is when you do something and no one knows that you did it. So these are parts of security. Um, and there is no such thing as a 100% secure system. Uh, and if, if you were to make one like that, you would have to remove uh, any kind of access to it. And that kind of makes it a, a, a poor system. You couldn't use to anything. So you have to give access, and with that you will have security weaknesses. And as a matter of fact, given enough time and effort, you could hack into any system. Uh, it's just a matter of, of uh, how much time you're willing to, to put on it, and, and maybe sometimes what kind of skills you have. But it usually doesn't require a lot of skills. Um, and so I would define security as uh, trying to protect a sensitive system or sensitive information for as long as that information or system remains sensitive. And, uh, or for as long as possible, but never forever. Uh, so that's setting the scene what security kind of means. Uh, so what has it looked like up until today? This here is the typical attack surface. An attack surface is basically the playing ground for a hacker or malicious software. So this is what they're trying to access and do something with. Nowadays, we might have slightly nicer looking boxes, but they're still the same boxes. The same components, po components more or less, inside. The software have changed, but they work pretty much the same way. Uh, and we are quite good at protecting this. We do know how to protect a computer. Uh, we have the knowledge and skills, and we have a lot of software. So when we have breaches and security problems here, it's often down to the user. Um, and we can protect these machines as single machines or as networks. Uh, and I'll just run through a few threats that we have seen here. Uh, and the reason we selected these threats is that they will apply to what we call Internet of Things as well. And first of all, I'm just going to go through something called ransomware. 
And this is something that we've seen on the rise quite a lot lately. Uh, there's money to be made in this one, and that's why it's popular. Anyone ever experienced ransomware? You have. You have. It's not a nice experience, is it? Uh, basically, what it does is that somehow some piece of software managed to get installed on a machine, and then it encrypts the data on that machine, and it throws up a message saying, if you want your data back, please pay. And usually that sum isn't large enough to be a problem. It's just easier to pay it than try to defeat it. Uh, and actually, the, the biggest player in this, the biggest software in this, they have actually retired. Somehow they, they gave up and gave out their, their, their encryption keys. It might be conscious, it might be something else. Uh, but still, there are a massive amount of, of people trying to make money within this field, and that's really a problem. We're going to see that a little bit later on. The next one is Remote Access Trojan. Um, anyone have, has anyone received a phone call from Microsoft Support Center in India? Yeah, were they helpful? Uh, well, surprise, they don't work for, for Microsoft, but you already knew that. Um, uh, but somehow, they still managed to identify that your particular Windows installation had a problem with it. And that's even if you're a proud Mac owner. Uh, and they're actually getting better at this, because now they just hand you over to their Mac support uh, department. Uh, yeah, but, but that phone call will eventually lead up to them trying to make you install a piece of software. And that piece of software is usually classified as a remote access Trojan. Uh, and a remote access Trojan, it might look like something else, but it will enable someone else to access your system remotely. And that's without your knowledge. And they can basically do anything they like with it. So it's kind of putting in a backdoor into the system. Uh, the final one is denial of service, or its bigger brother called distributed denial of service, and that's DDoS for short. Uh, and this has become a, quite a political tool, because this is used to make systems uh, not respond, not being able to deliver whatever service is supposed to, to deliver. So usually this attack is towards websites which host uh, uh, web pages for governments or political organizations or, or similar uh, type of organizations. Uh, and here, it works in a way that they, it, it has a large network of, of PCs. And these PCs are infected machines. They are anyone's machines, but they don't know that they're actually working for this network. And there's a centralized service that issues commands. Uh, and it tells these machines to start sending requests to a particular server. And if you do that with high enough frequency, with uh, uh, as many requests as you can, eventually that web server will stop responding. And then you have achieved your goal. You have made that a denial of service. Uh, and this does actually happen, to give you an example, it happens in the beginning of this month, mostly every, every year, with uh, the Swedish tax office, office webpage. Um, and to be completely honest, that is not a typical, typical denial of service attack. That is just poor planning from us, are the tax players, because we need to hand in our tax declarations. And we do that at the same time but it's the same effect. And the, and the, the goal, uh, the effect here is that we, we're giving a few more days to do it. So I guess it's a win-win. Uh, but that's a denial of service in, 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 a, in a sense. So this is, this is what we have seen, or at least a few of them. There are many, many more threats. Uh, so what will it look like now when we start connecting all these things? Well. This here is the future attack surface. Shocking, isn't it? Uh, ordinary household appliances. Uh, 
That's what we're connecting, among other things. Uh, and why can these things be dangerous? I mean, they, they are, doesn't look very dangerous. The problem is that many of them, at least unintentionally, open up our home networks. Uh, and this one here is called the eye kettle. And the eye kettle, uh, it does uh, a few things really, really well. Uh, the first thing it does is that it boils water to near perfection. And you can control this through an app. You set the temperature and you set the time and everything. So it's really cool and we all want one. The second thing it does really well, at least if you ask it politely enough, is that it will hand out the password of your home Wi-Fi. And now we don't want one all of a sudden. Um, and, and the people that, that, that discovered this, they used uh, something that was intended to be used as a maintenance uh, service. And a very, very common problem with these things, uh, the default administration password. So they managed to remotely access this using a password that wasn't changed and then extract the information they wanted. Uh, and the problem here is that we, since it's ordinary household appliances, it's also ordinary people without special security knowledge that is going to use them. So in a sense, if this is your grandmother who, who won't understand this, Ish, no one should have to understand it. We have to be quite creative when we connect these things and still make them secure. And I, I, I bet you the same way that McDonald's, they on their coffee cups, uh, at least in America, it says caution hot content on them, uh, like no one would know, I don't know. But still, it says that. Uh, I'm sure that in the future, when you go and buy a light bulb, so on the package it will say caution default password. Because uh, it's such a common problem. Uh, and if, you, if you're going to take one thing from this tonight, is always change the default password. Your home security will be 100% better after that. Um, but, of course, it, this is not the only device uh, or connected thing that, that uh, is a little bit too chatty for its own good. There are many, many more examples, and I'll just go through a few more. Um, let's start with uh, this one here. This is uh, a product that's part of the Wemo uh, home automation system made by Belkin, and although they are quite good at security nowadays. Uh, when this was launched uh, a few years ago, um, they, I'm not sure, entirely sure if it's uh, because of it was a tight budget or if it was just sloppy developers or, or uh, it was uh, a tough deadline. But they didn't include security. So people bought this, put them in a home, and you just have to stick into the wall and you stick whatever you want to control in it, and then you fire up the app, and you can turn on and off your lights. The problem was that they took some shortcuts. They used a protocol which is notoriously difficult to secure, uh, although quite easy to use, and it's usually used for voice over IP. Uh, so they used that to have the things talk to each other. Uh, and it was completely unsecured. So it was easy to just monitor the traffic, get the passwords, and start sending controls to these things. And in fact, you could send uh, a rapid amount or a very quick amount of commands to these uh, devices, so it would actually break. Uh, and, and just a few weeks ago, Samsung has, has released uh, uh, its own product within this called SmartThings. I don't think it's available in Europe yet, uh, but they got some criticism because they also didn't consider security. Uh, and uh, they, they, they allow third-party apps to be installed on their system. And 
you could quite easily release an app which was overprivileged, which means that it asked for more privileges uh, or permissions from the system that it really needs. And with that, these people who hacked it, they could extract things like PIN codes for secured doors, and they could even exchange it to something else. And that was without actually doing a lot of work. Samsung blames third-party developers, so no one is really sure about who, who, who's responsible for that. Belkin fixed their things, uh, their security problems within a few days. So, um, and there is, I mean, th this here covers also, there's a lot of, of baby monitors and webcams and all that are connected to the internet, and most of them have the problem with default passwords. I think there's roughly 31,000 webcams in Sweden and a large chunk of them is completely open to anyone who wants. And that's not because the owner wanted that way, it's just because the owner didn't know they should change the default password. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Samsung. Uh, this is the holy grail of connected devices. This is something we always wanted to have connected. This is the fridge. So Samsung has made this connected fridge, which is wonderful. Uh, it has a nice touch screen on the front and you can do all kinds of things with it. Again, the problem was that they forgot about security. Uh, so this fridge doesn't actually check if it's Google surf servers that it's talking to. Uh, so you could easily put yourself in between and just pick out that Gmail account and password. And as we all know, we have the same password in all accounts, so we know what, what that would have done. Uh, and it's also theorized, uh, it's not completely sure if it's the case, but it's theorized that it's quite easy to remotely control it. Uh, there are a few security weaknesses in it. Uh, meaning that the, the, the temperature of your beer is actually in the hand of some script kitty somewhere else in the world meaning they will always have warm beer. Um, so yeah, that's the problem. And, and, and I think this is something we adults want, of course. We won't have everything connected. So why shouldn't our kids have it as well? Uh, and of course they should. So meet Barbie. We all know this product, this brand. It's one of the biggest uh, toy brands in the world, uh, owned by Mattel. And they, they recently released this Barbie doll called Hello Barbie. Uh, and, and this is a connected device. Uh, your child can have a semi-intelligent conversation with this doll and it will reply back with a voice, with something that is coherent. And it's using similar technology as Apple's Siri and uh, Microsoft Cortana. So it's a quite advanced piece of uh, device. The only problem is, it's a toy. And because it's a toy, it needs to be very easy to configure. You should basically only be able to unwrap it, pick it out and start using it. And that's where the security problem comes in. Because this toy connects to any Wi-Fi that's called Barbie. It, it doesn't check who is ha having that Wi-Fi, it just connects to it and gives complete access to everything inside. So by connecting it to a malicious Wi-Fi called Barbie, you can actually extract recorded uh, audio from it that's stored inside. And you will get direct access to the microphone. I Meaning you can turn it on and you can listen to anything that goes on in that child's bedroom. Uh, which, which, of course, isn't a good thing. Uh, Mattel, they have issued a fix for this. I mean, they are, uh, it used to be the biggest toy manufacturer in the world, they're still quite big. Uh, so they are, they are uh, interested in keeping good faith in this. So they have fixed it, but the problem is, still, it's a toy. Who's updating it? You have to manually update it. You do that through an app, but you still have to do it. 
So there's going to be a lot of these toys just laying around unprotected everywhere. And that's a big problem, not only for toys. And just if this is Mattel, just think of all the lesser known brands or the unknown brands doing this similar toy in the future. Are they going to consider security? Probably not. Um, uh, let's go back to a favorite one. Let's talk a little bit more about Samsung. We just love Samsung. Um, just consider that new, shiny, 88-inch curved TV that you just bought. It's lovely. Uh, and the whole neighborhood is just envy of you, you know? Um, but this, this, is, this is probably the most intrusive device ever, at least of the ones that I brought up. Um, last year, Samsung went out and warned all their customers. Does anyone own a Samsung in here? TV? You do? Yeah? All right, uh, this, this only applies to TVs. They probably do lots of other things on Samsung uh, phones. But, um, well, I'll tell you what, if you had one, you wouldn't feel as comfortable in your own home anymore after what I'm going to tell you now. So they went out and warned all the customers. And they warned their customers not to disclose any private uh, information in front of their TVs. What? I mean, where else are you disclosing private information? That's what you do in front of the TV. So, so why is that? Why, why did they warn? Well, Samsung TVs, they are always on. Even if you turn them off, they're still on. And they are constantly monitoring their surroundings and recording sounds from it. And then they take that sound recording and send off to a server for processing. And they do all that, yes, you can control the TV with your voice. And that's really convenient. The only problem is that Samsung is using third-party servers, so they cannot guarantee confidentiality within your own home. And that's a really serious problem, because the only thing we, 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 we used to be able to trust was that we have privacy in our own home. And this is a typical example in what we are looking at when we're connecting everything in our homes. We need to consider that we, we keep the confidentiality in homes. Uh, and now we basically connected everything. So why shouldn't we connect the toilet? I don't know why we should, but people have. Um, Laxil, which is uh, one of the biggest manufacturers of toilets in Japan, and Japanese people are crazy about toilets, we all know that, so why shouldn't they have connected ones? Um, you can control this through an app. Not entirely sure why you're sitting on it, so. Uh, but, of course, it can be hacked as well. And uh, remotely controlled. And a few of the functions that it has is that it can open and close the lid. And of course, it could flush. And it has a B-Day function in it. And I'm just going to leave it to that. I'm just going to leave it to your imagination what's going to happen when a malicious hacker accesses your toilet. Um, so we just move on to the next one instead. This is a beautiful car. It's a Tesla Model S. Uh, it's a high-technology car. This is what they do. They are building the, the, the most advanced connected car ever. And they're quite good at it, actually. Um, and because of all, all its electronics and uh, being an electric car as well, it has one advantage over the traditional car, and that is that it's impossible to do that Hollywood-style hot wiring in it to steal it because those cables don't exist. Unless, of course, you bring a laptop. If you get into that car with a laptop, it's actually possible to connect the laptop to an Ethernet cable behind the dashboard. And through that, you could start the car. And that's because there are a few security, or at least there was a few uh, security weaknesses in it. 
Uh, and those security weaknesses existed in the web browser of the infotainment system. So it was theorized that you could craft a specific website that when you access it through the web browser in this car, it could actually re remotely access it and take over a few functions. Uh, but that just kind of proves that you shouldn't be driving and browsing the web at the same time. Uh, but Tesla is a very good company when it comes to security. So they have fixed this problem and they have something called over the ear uh, updates. So they can send out updates uh, to all their cars and then the only thing that a user has to do is click an OK button on, on the screen and will update it and fix these security issues. So, so they are working hard on actually making this work. If you remember about a year ago, there was another car, a Jeep Cherokee, that was remotely hacked while driving. Um, and that was a lab hack, but it was in, on the open road in a city. And the driver, he was aware it's going to happen, but he didn't know what's going to happen. These people hacked the car and took over all functions. They have steering and brake and everything else. He couldn't do anything. Um, and that's quite scary. And the reason why you could do that on the Jeep Cherokee rather than do it on Tesla was that Jeep, they hadn't properly separated the infotainment system, which is where the hack was, with the important functions of the car, like steering. Um, and Fiat Chrysler, they, they are fixing this. I mean, they have to fix it. The only problem they have is that they have to recall a hundred thousands and millions of cars to fix it, whereas Tesla just issues an over-the-ear over update. So, considering the, the traditional manufacturers of cars, uh, they, they have not, they are not used to working with security within this field. They're doing everything they can to connect their cars, but they don't know a lot about software security. Uh, they are learning, but it's going to be a tough process. Um, I'm just going to give you one th more thought about Tesla here to think about. And Tesla, they do have the... the um, possibility, and, and they haven't actually uh, announced this publicly, uh, at least they haven't done it before, they, they can actually remotely disable any car they like, uh, and that's after you bought it. And that will completely mobilize the car, you can't go anywhere. Uh, so, so think about it, is that something that Tesla is supposed to be able to do? What's the timeout? Uh, is that something Tesla should be able to do, or should that kind of power reside with the owner, rather? Just think about that. Um, that's a few differences of things that we could potentially buy and have in our homes or in the surroundings. But that's not the only thing that we're connecting. We're connecting a lot of other things and a lot of medical equipment. Uh, and why shouldn't we? But there are serious problems with that as well. Again, the, this industry is well known for its security, but it's not familiar with connected security. Um, and there's been uh, quite many problems this year, uh, and that's with ransomware. Uh, there was a, a medical uh, center in uh, LA just recently that had to pay roughly $17,000 just to regain access to their own patient records. And there's been two hospitals in Germany also quite recently that where their equipment has malfunctioned because it couldn't or they couldn't access necessary data uh, on a server somewhere because that was encrypted. So when we start connecting these things, we're not only looking at some family photos somewhere, we're looking on serious functionality that we are dependent on. It might be the difference between life and death. 
Um, there is this guy called Sergei uh, Loshkin, and I apologize if I uh, didn't pronounce his uh, last name correctly. Uh, but he's a security researcher, and he works for a very large security firm uh, in Russia, quite well known, uh, and he lives in Moscow. Uh, and he wanted to find out the level of security on his local hospital. So what he did was that he, he went to a online service called Shodan, uh, and this is a search engine uh, much like Google, but unlike Google, it doesn't index websites. It indexed connected devices. So this is where you find your own webcam. Uh, and yes, since you're all thinking about it now, you can have the web address. I'll give it to you later on. Um, so he went there and he searched a little bit for connected medical equipment, and he found quite many. Uh, and some of them were running on outdated software like Windows XP, which nothing should run on anymore. Some of them were missing uh, really critical security patches, and a lot of them still had the default password set. And the problem with default password is that you can Google for any manual on these machines, and you'll get the default password, and there are even databases of default passwords on any kind of device, and that's including your home Wi-Fi uh, router. Um, so, and he did find a few uh, equipment from uh, his particular hospital. But it turns out that they were quite good at security, so he couldn't access them remotely. So what did he did was that he took his laptop, and he took his car, drove down to the hospital, and sat down in the waiting room. And he opens his laptop, and he scanned for, for uh, what, what kind of Wi-Fi networks were available. And there was a few of them. Uh, and then after a few hours of brute forcing the password on these uh, Wi-Fi uh, networks, he managed to access one. And what I said earlier was that given enough time and effort, you could hack any system. And a few hours of brute forcing password is too short. This was a two-week password. It should take days or weeks to brute, uh, brute force a password. Uh, so he got access to the local network. And then he found the number, the first uh, mistake that the manufacturer of this particular machine, uh, it wasn't this machine, but it was a machine like it, uh, the first mistake they've done. And that was to trust connections coming from the inside. You should never trust any connections to anything. If they come remotely or they come from your own network, never trust them. Uh, but the manufacturer thought, well, that's, that's fine. It's go only going to be medical stuff. But this is the most common way of hacking things. You do it from the inside. Because you know security is a lot lower there. So he, can ma he managed to access the doctor's interface of this machine uh, where he could get patient's records. And then there was this other little thing, which is the second mistake that this manufacturer made. And why they made this mistake, not sure. It could be that the programmers thought it would be a good thing, or support wanted it. But there was this little button he could press, and he will get a command terminal for that machine. And with that, he got complete access to the entire file system of that machine and he could download all the patient records and data from it. And that's, that's classified personal information. He could, if he wanted to, he could have installed uh, ransomware there, which, which made that machine completely useless and probably weak something they can use it again. Uh, he, uh, he could, if he was a real malicious hacker, he would have installed a remote access Trojan so he could access it later on from the outside. And so all these findings that he had is a bit worrying because these are functions that we rely on. They should not have security weaknesses. Uh, but Internet of Things is a new area for everyone. We're good at working on our little thing, but we are 
very bad when we put everything together. Uh, and of course, hospitals is just part of it because we are now building the biggest attack surface ever. We are connecting everything that we can. That includes, of course, the hospital and the equipment there, but it's the public transportation system, it's industries, uh, it's schools, it's everything else, it's the whole city. Uh, and of course, these things have been computerized before. It's not like it's new, uh, but it's too e expensive to exchange the old hardware for new hardware. So rather than putting in new modern stuff, we're connecting the old things. And they might not have build, built to be part of a larger network. And we have already seen quite many attacks that is kind of a taste of what is going to be in the future if we don't take security more serious than we have done. Um, there's been examples of uh, traffic lights being hacked by drones. So you fly a drone over a street and you change the light. Be quite nice when you're driving to car, particularly down here, uh, but still it's not maybe so good. Uh, and there, there's also been uh, industries where, where hackers have remotely accessed big manufacturing equipment and overloaded them, so they actually caused some serious damage. Uh, and in Ukraine, for example, there's been hacks against power plants that caused major power cuts throughout the country. And that's a really serious thing, because everything we do demands some form of electricity. So we're connecting these important functions in society, and we need to safeguard them. There's also been hacks against, against water treatment plants. And we all know what water treatment plants do. They make sure we can drink the water. Uh, and Denial of service has another ring to it when we think about the water we drink and connecting that plant that's actually purifying it. So, so th there are some serious issue issues within all this. Um, and of course, there, uh, I haven't actually mentioned uh, him, but he's been there all the time, and that's Big Brother. Um, and this could be Big Brother, or at least one of them. Uh, this, this guy here, his name is uh, James Clapper. Uh, he works, uh, he oversees and directs the National uh, Intelligence Program in America. Uh, he's the security advisor for, for a lot of security uh, councils in America. Uh, Homeland Security is one of them, and uh, we've all seen that TV show, so we know what that's about, uh, more or less. Uh, and he also is the security advisor of the president in America. So this is a serious guy. He has a finger in every single sanctioned spying activity by America. He knows what's going on. Uh, and he recently claimed, or, or, or at least um, admitted, that they are considering using IoT for information gathering. So he said, in the future, intelligence services might use the Internet of Things for identification, surveillance, monitoring, location tracking, and targeting for recruitment, or to gain access to networks or user credentials. So what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about all the existing devices that, that's already out there with their security flaws. Uh, and what kind of data is he talking about? Well, it could be any data, but it includes the data that we are generating. It's come from our toasters, our fridges, our microwaves, uh, our cars. It's really a map of our lives. And that's what they're considering using in order to gather intelligence. So this is another reason why we need to safeguard privacy in all of this. Because the worrying thing here is that James Clapper who we could potentially consider to be one of the good guys, at least in the western part of the world, if, if he and America is considering doing this, then 
every other intelligence agency in the world is considering doing this. And they might already be doing it. So this is a major threat to our privacy. Um, and whose responsibility is it then to make sure that we, we, as the end users, feel safe in all of this? It's not an easy question to, to answer, because uh, there's many sides to it, of course. But there are a few forces in this. Uh, and the first one is, of course, the industry itself. So these are the companies and the people that are manufacturing uh, the connected devices. Uh, and these companies are motivated by a few things. Usually it's money. But if you, if you look at it closely, or maybe on a lower level, it's, the motivation is uh, usually innovation. It's working within a cutting-edge field that improves the lives of everyone. To, to creating that cool device or that cool service that, that will be uh, making it better for you, you and me. Uh, but it's never really security that's the motivation. Because security isn't glamorous. Uh, it, it won't win you any awards at some trade show somewhere. And it costs a lot of money and it takes a long time to implement. Therefore, it gets cut uh, quite easily, particularly if you're trying to hit the market before everyone else. So never buy first-generation products. But anyway, um, so that's, that's one of the force uh, in all of this. Uh, then we have the government, or more, more precisely, laws and regulations. And this is a tool that we have uh, to protect the end user in all this. Uh, the problem with this tool here is that it wakes up a few years too late, usually. Uh, and it's a quite a blunt instrument. It has to cover a quite generic field, a lot of grounds, so you can't be so precise with it, so you can use laws in different ways. Uh, and of course, there have been many examples in, in quite recent uh, history uh, where uh, countries are trying to make laws that actually don't protect our, uh, us as end users, uh, and it just sort of makes the privacy uh, a little bit less private. Uh, a lot of that has happened in America, uh, but there have been things in the e EU as well. Um, and this, another problem with them is that we're not talking about one country. We're talking about all countries. This is an international market. Uh, so it's a bit like trying to regulate the internet. It's not that easy. So, so there's, there's a challenge as well. And in, the, in between all of these, there is the standards. And already we're seeing a lot of organizations being formed by the big players to try to, to agree on some sort of standards. And that's everything from communication uh, uh, standards to even security. The problem here is that it takes a long time. Uh, and it doesn't move as quick as the market. So, as of yet, we have not agreed on anything, uh, including how these things should communicate and how we should actually secure them. Uh, and in there, between somewhere, we actually have the user. What kind of responsibility does the user have in all this? And of course, they do have some responsibility, but like I said before, if your grandmother does, don't understand it, then maybe no one should have to do it. So we, we need to help the user, and that user could be an IT department as well, but the manufacturers need to help and make it easy to include security in all this. Uh, so in a sense, it only leaves the industry, uh, as of now at least. So what can the industry do? We have decades of skills and knowledge within uh, cybersecurity. Uh, we have secured websites now for the past 20 years or 30 years or so. Uh, so we know how to do that. We know how to use encryption and, and, and authentication mechanisms and, and all those things. So why are we not using them in a proper way? Well, the reason for that, 
uh, except that it costs a lot of money, is that that connected coffee machine that you, you're doing will not have the same CPU as a desktop, a modern desktop PC. The CPU in the, in the coffee machine will be just enough to uh, make your coffee in the morning. It will be the cheapest, most limited they could find. Uh, and that's not really looking to change because uh, we as consumers are not really prepared to pay any more than it costs already. So there is no incentive in actually using better equipment. Uh, and of course, if we are going to make it to 50 billion devices by the year 2020, this has to be cheap. Otherwise, we're not going to see the Internet of Things that everyone is, is, is wanting to have. So that's going to be a major challenge, trying to uh, do modern security implementation on these limited things. So we need to be quite creative and come up with new things. And that includes using different types of technology. Uh, for example, we are seeing now uh, standards for transmitting data that is using light. It's called LiFi, one of them. Uh, and it's, it's a very uh, quick protocol, or quick uh, technology. It can transfer a lot of, of data very quickly, but it needs some sort of clear line of sight in, in order to communicate, although it can bounce things off walls. But by using such technology, we could actually limit the access to those devices from, from external parties uh, because you need to be in that line of sight to talk to it. So you can't be in the room next door, which you could do with any Wi-Fi. So we need to use this kind of technology to, to protect our devices. Um, and we also need to use the physical world in other ways. If we lock things into rooms, we're going to secure it there. So, so we need to think, really think outside the box when we're trying to protect these things. Uh, and of course, what we are trying to do is to, or what we should be trying to do, is to build some sort of foundation of security uh, where we can build IoT on top of that. And this is really critical. And we should not uh, make any mistakes when we're doing it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a real-life example of, of something that is, has its foundation on security. Uh, and I will, of course, generalize a bit with it. And I'll remove the human factor, because that's always the weak, the weak uh, point. Um, take the postal service. So that's the traditional way of sending things in our society. Uh, that's, that's built up on security. You if you want to send a letter, you take that letter and you put that in an envelope, you seal it, and you write the receiver on the front. And with that, you got three things, three of the main aspects of security. The envelope is non-transparent, so you have confidentiality. No one can read it unless they open it. You seal the envelope, that gives you integrity. No one can change that letter easily. And since you didn't write the sender on the back of the envelope, you got anonymity. No one knows you sent it. And then you take that envelope and you put that in a locked mailbox. Uh, and then sp uh, uh, specialized trained personnel will show up in a specialized vehicle. They will open that box with the key and they will empty it into uh, most quite often sealed bags. Put that in the car drive off to an access control sorting facility, where it will be sorted, put in some other bags, in another special vehicle, driven by a trained personnel that would drive out to the receiver and put that into a box in front of their house. So that whole chain is built up on security. And think about it, that's one of the pillars of our society. That's what makes our society work, the postal service. We're trying to, we're trying to exchange that to some digital way, but this, this is one of the old pillars of it. 
And this new foundation that we're building, that is going to be another pillar of society. It's going to be how our society works, how we, we are communicating. So why don't we consider the security parts of this more than we are already? And we really need to do that. Um, Padmastre Warrior, I might pronounce her first name incorrectly. She was the former CTO of uh, Cisco. And she said a few years ago that we have connected or we have given IP addresses to roughly 1% of all potential devices in the world. Uh, so think about it. When we, we, when we give IP addresses to the rest of the 99% of the devices, when they wake up, we're going to have major security problems if we don't consider that right now. There's going to be so many devices and so much data floating everywhere that we need to have that foundation of security. We need to have that order and, and, and um, uh, security in place. Uh, but of course, uh, we could be worrying about the wrong things. And thank you so much for coming tonight and I hope you enjoyed it.